All right. I think we're, uh, the committee will come to order. Um, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time, which we will indeed do when they call votes. Uh, this hearing is entitled Rules and Procedures in the U.S. House of Representatives, a look at reform efforts and state best practices. And I now recognize myself for five minutes to give an opening statement. Uh, I'm, I'm going to quickly call an audible, though, and speak to the elephant in the room, which is truly the elephant in the room, the only elephant in the room right now. Um, uh, my terrific uh, uh, partner uh, in this effort, Tom Graves, uh, some of you may have seen, he recently, very recently, announced that, um, uh, that this would be his last term here. And um, when people back home ask me what I'm excited about in Washington, D.C., um, it's been very satisfying over the last year to say working with Tom Graves on this committee to try to make Congress function better. And uh, he's been a, a stupendous partner in that regard. And um, while I personally am aggrieved at his announcement of departure, I'm very happy for his family uh, that they will get a little bit more time with them. But I, I just want to recognize you and, and your service and most importantly, your partnership. So thank you for that. Um, so back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, every few decades or so, Congress decides it needs to fix itself. And so they create uh, committees like this um, and charge them with figuring out what problems uh, there are and recommending solutions to them. Uh, this committee, the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress, is the latest incarnation of that. Uh, the last reform committee prior to this one was the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress, which met in 1992 and 93. In fact, one of our witnesses today, Dr. Larry Evans, served as staff on that committee. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about that committee's efforts to re reform House rules and procedures, what, changed, um, what, you know, what changes they proposed and why. And I, sus I suspect that part of what we'll learn today is that reforming Congress's rules and procedures is really, really hard. And I, I know that's not a particularly bold observation, uh, but it's important to understand why all the reform committees that preceded this one really struggled to get the House to change its rules. Put simply, changing the House rules is not a zero-sum game. Uh, multiple actors are affected in multiple ways, and it's impossible to determine if the gains brought about by a particular change would perfectly offset the losses. Politics has a way of complicating things, so it doesn't make much sense to think about reforms in that way. It does, however, make sense to think about the institution as a whole and what can be done to make Congress function better on behalf of the American people, make it more effective, make it more efficient. You know, and I think in that regard, modern rules and procedures are essential if Congress is going to uphold its Article I responsibilities to act as a co-equal branch of government. In addition to learning about what previous reform committees have done, I'm also looking forward to hearing about what the states are doing to streamline some of their floor and committee procedures and to encourage bipartisan collaboration. Uh, there's a reason why this committee has consistently featured state-level perspectives in its hearing, and that is states tend to experiment and innovate a lot more than Congress does, and we can learn a lot from them. Um, and with that, uh, I'd like to uh, invite our uh, Vice Chair Tom Graves to share some opening remarks as well. Hey, Mr. Chairman. I'd take just a moment to thank you. Um, you're right, my family is excited today. Uh, three children and my wife, um, very supportive and excited about what we're, the, the next chapter and journey, even though we don't even know what that is yet. But um, let me just add, I think when we all first run for office, it's we all intend to make a difference, to have an impact, and we don't quite know how that'll manifest itself. We think it's in policy or tax reform or assisting constituents or healthcare, whatever it might be. Um, but for me, I could think of no greater way to uh, end my political uh, time here, my career, than to bookend it with what we're doing, with working beside you and the members of this committee to do what I think will be meaningful change, and that is to um, fix this broken place and uh, in a way that it will better serve the American people. So thank you for your leadership. and how you've guided this committee and the confidence you're giving me and the results that we will have that I can uh, now call this my final term, knowing that uh, we're going we're gonna to actually make a big difference. But as you said, we've, we've identified so many opportunities uh, to streamline processes and eliminate inefficiencies and produce solutions uh, to help our colleagues better help the people they serve. Um, and, uh, and so we want to continue with that today and um, that commitment we've all made, and that's examine the ways that we can help improve the rules and the procedures of the House. Um, this body has been rooted in history and, and rules and procedures and precedent for so long, 
And uh, I was unaware of this, but the, the rules package or book that we follow is over a thousand pages. And why wouldn't I know it's over a thousand? Because we generally waive all thousand pages. It feels like each and every day uh, we, we don't necessarily abide by it. And the American people deserve better. They, they deserve an institution that, that operates based on rules and procedures and consistently consistency. So uh, since this is the Modernization Committee, we have an opportunity to, to look at these areas and modernize our rules and procedures and, and, uh, and see what we can do to better assist the process. And as we did earlier this year, it's important for us to look at the past, look to the past, to learn what reforms worked, what didn't, and, uh, and why. So it's important that we keep open minds as we continue these conversations moving forward. And I, I certainly look forward to the hearing today. I think it's a very important hearing. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you holding it today and, and look forward to testimony. Um, thank you, and uh, again, thank you for uh, your partnership. And um, I know you're committed to running running to the tape. Uh, so um, we, in that regard, let's get cracking. We uh, welcome the testimony of our three witnesses today. Our first witness is Christopher Davis, an analyst on Congress and the legislative process at the Congressional Research Service. Mr. Davis's work at CRS focuses on parliamentary procedure and the history and operations of Congress, including efforts to revise chamber rules. Our next witness is Lauren, uh, is, uh, Dr. Lawrence Evans, a specialist in American national politics uh, and has been a member of the William and Mary faculty since 1987. He's the author of three books, The Whips, Building Party Coalitions in Congress, Congress Under Fire, Reform Politics in the Republican Majority, and Leadership in Committee, a comparative analysis of leadership behavior in the US Senate. During 1991, by the way, we are just killing it on Amazon on this committee. Um, uh, during 1991 to 93, Dr. Evans served as the staff associate for Chairman Lee Hamilton on the Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. He earned a BA in economics from Kenyon College, an MA in economics from the University of Virginia, and a PhD in political science from the University of Rochester. Last but not least, we are joined by Natalie Wood, who is the director of the Center for Legislative Strengthening at the National Conference of State Legislatures. She provides expertise and leads research on legislative institutional issues, including internal legislative operations, management and human resource policies, legislative workplace culture, and critical issues impacting representative democracy in the states. During her 15 years with NCSL, she held key roles working on ethics and lobbying policy, legislative management and organization, and leadership staffing. Prior to rejoining NCSL in 2019, Nalasi was a policy expert for Colorado nonprofit organizations. Thank you all for being with, it, with us. Uh, witnesses are reminded that your oral testimony will lim be limited to five minutes, and without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. Uh, Mr. Davis, you're now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Uh, Chairman Kilmer, Vice Chairman Graves, uh, members of the Select Committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'm Christopher Davis, an analyst on Congress and the legislative process at the Congressional Research Service, CRS. CRS's role is to provide objective, nonpartisan research and analysis to Congress. CRS does not take a position on the desirability of any specific procedures, policies, or practices. As requested in my oral testimony today, I will, one, briefly describe selected efforts to change the House's procedures undertaken during the post-World War II period, and two, suggest some possible lessons that lawmakers might draw from these prior reform efforts. House procedures rest on certain fundamental concepts, including majority rule, a deferral to the expertise of committees, strict limits on debate, a germaneness requirement for amendments, and an emphasis on timely action over lengthy floor deliberation. Broad trends in House procedure over recent decades include a significant expansion in the use of the suspension of the rules procedure, a routinization of the use of special rules to structure the amendment process, including on regular appropriation bills, the growth, of, the growth of rulemaking statutes that establish privileged procedures for the consideration of legislation, and a general shift from parliamentary spontaneity to procedural predictability on the House floor. As I detail in my written statement, numerous formal reviews of House procedures have been conducted over the past 70 years. The contemporary congressional system is primarily a product of the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1946, produced by a bipartisan, bicameral Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress, JCOC in short, uh, which among other things streamlined the committee system and codified committee jurisdictions. The 1970 Legislative Reorganization Act was the product of more than five years of work, including by another Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress, spread over three separate Congresses. In addition to enacting significant committee procedural changes, 
most of the things we see in today uh, codified in House Rule 11. The 1970 Act authorized the creation and use of the House's electronic voting system. The 1973 and 1974 Select Committee on Committees, often referred to as the Bowling Committee after its chair, undertook a detailed examination of uh, House procedures, including its jurisdictional rules. While the House ultimately rejected a committee jurisdictional realignment proposed by the Bowling Committee, it did agree to significant procedural changes it suggested, including granting the Speaker of the House the power to refer legislation to more than one committee for consideration, multiple referral of bills. Another joint committee in the Organization of Congress, as you indicated, Mr. Chairman, was created in the early 1990s, uh, and I know that Dr. Evans will address that in detail. While few of the recommendations of this joint committee were adopted at the time, important parts of, it work, of its work were later, later included in House rules. In 1995, Republicans assumed the majority in both chambers for the first time in 40 years. Many procedural changes adopted by the 104th Congress grew out of prior reform proposals, including that Joint Committee on the Organization of Congress. Changes adopted at this time include adding a protection to House rules of the minority party's ability to offer a motion to recommit with instructions to major legislation. There are many lessons that lawmakers might take from prior rules revision efforts when deciding whether to suggest changes to House procedures. These lessons might include the following. One, there appears to be specific times when procedural reform is ripe in the House. These include times when large numbers of representatives believe that Congress as an institution is at a power disadvantage via the executive branch, and also when rank and file members are dissatisfied with aspects of their work life or their work life balance. Two, successful prior efforts have been guided by a clear identification of problems as well as a focus on achievable goals which could include simplifying and clarifying House rules, repealing defunct procedures, decentralizing decision-making, increasing minority rights, or promoting more transparency in committee work. Three, leadership support is critical, and some procedural changes have taken more than one Congress to implement. Four, some past procedural efforts have focused not just on developing new ideas, but on identifying existing innovations underway in the House and promoting their widespread use. Number five, history suggests that realigning committee jurisdictions is difficult and potentially contentious. And six, and finally, close consultation with the House Parliamentarian and the Committee on Rules is critical when considering procedural revisions. These entities can provide expert counsel to the Select Committee to ensure that any proposed procedural change is constructed in a manner that achieves lawmakers' goals functions in practice, not just in theory, and is in harmony with the larger body of House rules and precedents. This concludes my prepared remarks. If additional research and analysis related to this subject would be helpful, I and my colleagues at CRS stand ready to assist the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Dr. Evans, you're now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Oh, thanks very much. Um, first, Mr. Kilmer, uh, Mr. Graves, and the committee, I just want to thank you for the invitation. I'm uh, really pleased to be here. As mentioned, my name is Larry Evans. I uh, teach congressional politics at uh, the College of William & Mary. I've done so for over 30 years. In the early 1990s, worked with uh, Chairman Lee H. Hamilton on the Joint Committee and Organization of Congress, uh, which was referenced. I uh, just want to emphasize that uh, Lee Hamilton, uh, for nearly 40 years, was a magisterial member of this body. Uh, and anything useful I might have to say about congressional reform, I probably, I probably learned from him. Um, that said, I wanted to just speak briefly about the, uh, the, the main subject of today's hearing, which is the procedures of the House and uh, to somewhat uh, committee and prospects for reform. Um, when you look at, at, at procedure, particularly on the floor, there's, there's a balance in design that has to be struck between the needs of the majority to move its program through the House, um, but also the, the rights of the minority. And, uh, and here I mean not just partisan minorities, but political minorities, uh, members of the majority party as well, to have access and to participate in a meaningful way. Um, I think most observers of this chamber, and, and you all may agree as well, would say that over the past 20 to 30 years since the Joint Committee met, that that balance has shifted perhaps too far towards majority party power and away from minority rights, both for the minority party, again, and also for, uh, for members of, uh, of the majority. 
And so the question for me, what I, I grappled with in preparing my remarks was what might be done within this committee, uh, within the current environment, to perhaps nudge things back in the other direction. Um, I think the attention of, 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 of members who, who grasp with this, this tension almost naturally goes on the floor to the motion to recommit with instructions. And I can tell you that the Joint Committee in the early 90s spent more time on this fairly arcane procedure on the House side than, than anything else. Um, the motion to recommit, as you know, uh, is a, basically a, a kind of a last ditch procedural motion right before the vote on final passage where the minority under the rules is guaranteed the right to offer amendatory instructions. Um, this right, as, as Chris uh, mentioned, was first placed in House rules in 1995 and it grows out of some deliberations and, and drafting that was done in the Joint Committee and Organization of Congress. Um, the, the Joint Committee, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the motion to recommit, if anything now, is more important than it was back in the 90s because of broader changes that have occurred uh, in the restrictiveness of House floor procedure. Now, restrictive procedure dates back to the, the 70s. You started to see a shift away from open rules. But this really took off in the 2000s uh, to the point that now, uh, based on recent data, uh, open rules are basically non-existent uh, in the House. And it's not, it's not just Republican leadership or Democratic leadership, both parties do this. Uh, we see rules now, about half of which, roughly, are closed. And by closed, I mean precluding amendments except those offered by the, uh, the Committee of Jurisdiction. Uh, so no opportunity, really, for dissident views or the minority to, partic to participate. The other half are structured, uh, which is kind of a fancy way of saying uh, not many uh, opportunities to, uh, to participate. The, the, the amendments are sharply limited and only to those listed in the, the rule or the accompanying report. Um, and so the motion to recommit with instructions now is really the only guaranteed point of access that the minority party has into the House floor. Now, another issue, and this is a, another change since the Joint Committee met, is we've seen the rise of what some would call message politics. Um, Message politics is hard to define, it's hard to quantify, but you, you know it when you see it. Uh, it's largely the fusion of legislative work with party campaigning. Uh, it's uh, an emphasis not so much on forging agreements uh, to deal with the problems of the day in a meaningful way, but on scoring political points, uh, demonizing the opposition. Um, unfortunately, um, if you were to design a, a motion, a question, uh, for, uh, for consideration more appropriate for message politics, you'd have a harder time doing that, more so than the motion to, motion to recommit with instruction. It just invites that kind of treatment um, because of where it is in the process and the fact that um, there's, no, there's no warning. And it's also procedural, which means there are incentives for the minority uh, to, to focus on message politics because they know that there's gonna be reflexive partisanship on the vote. Um, it may be time to revisit this committee and, and more generally the motion to recommit. Um, one option would be to basically remove it from the rules, but shift that amending opportunity for the minority into the committee of the whole. It, the minority has to have some role in floor deliberations for the process to be deliberative. Uh, just one suggestion. The rise of restrictive amendment procedures has also raised the importance of meaningful participation in committee. Uh, since the joint committee met in the 90s, if anything, uh, standing committees, the great committees of this body uh, have atrophied uh, in, uh, in their role. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go into much depth here. Uh, it's covered in my, my statement. But there are some things that this, this select committee could consider to revitalize the, the committee process, raising uh, the resources associated with committee staff and perhaps opening up the agenda setting process in committee so that um, bills that are widely supported are guaranteed markup time. In other words, take the basic idea behind the consensus calendar, back it up to the committee level, and move forward in that way. So let me stop there, and, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Evans. And uh, finally, Ms. Wood, uh, you're now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm Natalie Wood. I'm the director of the Center for Legislative Strengthening at NCSL. We are the national bipartisan organization serving all state legislators and all state legislative staff. Our mission is to strengthen the legislative institution, create interstate connections, and be the state's voice on Capitol Hill. And we have an old saying at NCSL, if you've seen one legislature, you've seen one legislature. While our state lawmaking bodies have similar structures, powers, and duties, they are diverse in their operations and traditions. And you can look no further than the legislative process for proof of this. Uh, state legislative chambers have a constitutional right to adopt their own rules, and we often describe them as tried and true. 
Recent NCSL research reveals certain rules and procedures can mitigate the effects of political polarization on policymaking. I'll cover four ways legislative chambers use the process to encourage collaboration, bipartisanship, and efficiency. The first is managing time. The second is structuring committee work. The third is instituting decorum. And the fourth is building relationships. While my remarks will be general, I have specific state examples in my testimony, the written testimony. On managing time, all but nine state legislatures have constitutionally required session adjournment dates. Legislators cite limited session length as an advantage that forces efficiency. Deadlines, calendars, and schedules help with the caveat that cooperation between the chambers, direction on the part of leaders, and discipline on the part of members impact their efficacy. About three quarters of all chambers use deadline systems, such as limits on bill introduction and committee action, which creates a discipline and rhythm to the process and can spur interchamber compromise. State legislatures also use floor calendars to create predictability and minimize conflicts for members. Calendar for floor debate can be set automatically by committee or by a leader. Um, in the chamber, it sort of represents different philosophies about who should control legislative priorities. In state legislatures, you'll rarely find standing committees meeting during floor session. Many chambers establish committee schedules with a specific time, day, and place to meet and assign a member to one committee in each block of time. Legislatures structure committee work. Um, as we know, committees do the legislature's homework and they're the public's main point of access into the process. Empowered committees that deliberate effectively and incorporate minority point of view can mitigate the effect of polarization on policymaking. And they are particularly effective when leaders empower them to negotiate and act. About 20% of the 99 chambers have a requirement that all bills be heard in committee. And some require all bills be reported out with the goal of promoting fairness and transparency. And lastly, nearly half of all chambers allow the minority party to give formal input into committee membership and a quarter provide equitable party balance in committee. On decorum, uh, it, de it safeguards the rights and privileges of all members, provides an equal opportunity to be heard, ensures good faith, and promotes full discussion. Common strategies from the states preclude members from using proper names, referring to the other chamber or branch of government, and prohibit indecent language. And on the subject of debate, most state constitutions require a bill to address or contain a single subject, and most legislatures have rules about the germaneness of amendments and motions. These provisions can keep the process on track and avoid diversions that can get in the way of policymaking. On building relationships, chambers use custom, tradition, and practices to strengthen member relationships. This can include joint co-prime sponsorship of bills, negotiating a rule of no surprises on the floor, bipartisan seating arrangements, which I know you've covered, celebrating a member's first bill, and using the committee structure and process to build bipartisanship. When might a legislative body consider changing its rules? Some ideas. Uh, if the rules are frequently suspended, if there are multiple interpretations of a rule, if the chamber frequently consults its parliamentary authority, if there's structural change to the body, when there's a switch in party control or leadership, or if a new technology arises. And it's important to know what rules are right for one legislature might not be right for another. Additionally, we observe that the fair and consistent application of rules or regular order builds trust, and ignoring this principle breeds mistrust. In summary, there is no one-size-fits-all approach to state legislative rules and procedure. State legislative bodies offer many examples of how the legislative process can be used for efficiency and for collaboration. Those rules build trust and bipartisanship when applied in a fair and consistent way. And there are indicators you can look to when deciding what might need to change. Um, paraphrasing Ed Burdick, who's the former longtime chief clerk in the Minnesota House, to operate a flourishing modern legislative institution, public officials must be willing to examine its weaknesses. I commend the committee for its work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your testimony. I think um, they're going to call votes soon, but we're going to try to get to as many people and as many questions as we can before that happens, and then we'll take a tasty cake time out. Um, I'll uh, recognize myself for five minutes to kick us off. And I want to um, start on the issue of regular order. I think we constantly hear this refrain of, you know, things would be better if we could return to regular order and that a lot of the procedural problems that we complain about could be solved simply by following regular order. I, I, the thing that I'm trying to get my head around is what would that, what would that look like and how would we actually do that? Um, you know, and I, I guess I'd levy this question at each of you, and Ms. Wood, you know, in, in you, you know state legislatures better than everyone in this room. Um, 
you referred to regular order as an assurance, especially as a matter of fairness toward the minority that rules and procedures will be followed consistently, which I think is good. I'd love to get a sense from you of some ideas from the states about how Congress could encourage regular order. So if we can just uh, run through your observations on that topic, I'd be grateful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So as you uh, indicate, this idea of, quote, regular order is in one way in the eye of the beholder. Uh, my CRS colleague, Dr. Wolfter Olazak, who I know the select committee's heard from previously, has actually been looking at this issue recently. And it's a very complicated, long-term idea of what constitutes regular order. But I think generally speaking, what most people think of that is a referral to committee or committees, some sort of committee uh, consideration, whether that's formal or informal, and then a floor process where members can have debate and perhaps amendment as well. As well. And so I think that generally speaking, that's what people think about it. And so it is something to think about as far as uh, for members that are looking at rules reform to try to see whether there are ways to promote that common understanding of regular order. But I would just point out as well that uh, a good portion of the overall work of the House comes directly to the floor. For example, almost half of the measures considered under the suspension of the rules procedure, uh, the committee's discharged of its consideration. There isn't a formal markup where the committee meets and votes to do it. And so as you balance this question of coming up with a process, uh, I think it's uh, arguably important to keep in mind the flexibility to be able to, if a majority of members or a super majority of members think that bringing something to the floor directly, that there's an informal committee process, for lack of a better word, that that also is important to the House. Dr. Evans. Sure, uh, regular order in a technical sense just means following the rules. Um, but as you, as you mentioned you know, earlier, uh, the, the House typically proceeds by waiving its rules. Uh, I think maybe a more meaningful definition or usage of regular order, and I think this is what members are primarily talking about when they, when they raise concerns, uh, is a committee process on major bills that's meaningful, where you have real deliberation with members of both parties in the room, and decisions are not being essentially laid on those committees by leadership. That stage would be part of regular order. Uh, and then also when you go to the floor, a reasonable array of amending opportunities. I'm not saying necessarily an open rule, yeah. uh, but enough so that the major issues are, are, are considered. Can I ask you on that first point, if you were staffing this committee, are there specific recommendations you would make to, in, to enable that? Well, um, in committee, uh, this is hard because you're basically looking at a political environment where there are incentives for leadership to be involved pretty much at every stage of the process. And, that, and that's, you're not gonna change you. There's no procedural fix uh, to that pattern. But on the margin, there are things that you can do to uh, invigorate committees. Uh, I mentioned this in my, in my written statement. It's striking to me, looking at the data, how much committee staffs have shrunk in size um, since the 1990s. I mean, they literally have been cut back 50%. And, you know, you can use whatever rules or procedures you want in committee, but if the committee doesn't have an independent basis of expertise is very hard to have an effective, an effective markup process. Now, you can respond and say, but there are other places you can go for expertise and the member offices and think tanks, so on and so forth. But I really think that the committee itself needs to have this independent base so there's gonna be a reliance on lobbyists or, or no one at all. So that's one thing I would point out. Now on the floor, it gets tougher because you're talking about the rules committee. Um, one approach would be, as I suggested, perhaps providing for a guarantee of a minority party opportunity to offer a substitute in the committee of the whole. This would be a radical departure from existing practice. Um, but short of that, just conversations that could be had, uh, maybe focusing on particular issue areas yeah. where there's an understanding that the minority will back away from the message stuff in exchange for real opportunities to participate. I mean, those are the things that I, I would point to. Ms. Wood. I mean, I would echo what um, Mr. Davis said about um, the committee processes and legislatures follow um, that model of referring bills to committee, hearing them there. Again, the public participation component is very important. That's where, really where citizens can come and sign up and testify on a bill, um, which increases openness and transparency. Um, and, and the referral back onto the floor, I mean, all of, the, all of what he had to say is, is, you know, kind of where I would go with my remarks. And I just think legislatures are doing, you know, the, like as I mentioned in my testimony, some states, uh, every bill must get a hearing in committee, which is remarkably different, um, it sounds like. So that's one example of a, a really different model. Some require they be reported out as well, so. Thank you, let me invite uh, Vice Chair Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I have a couple different questions. The first one I wanted to um, sort of touch on earmarks a second in a different perspective. We've heard the, the ills of earmarks and the abuses. We're all aware of those. But now we've had eight years to look back on on the removal of the earmarking process and has it had a positive impact or a negative impact? And I guess we're all sort of analyzing is there a way forward uh, to a, a newer, transparent, um, um, better uh, approach to empowering the legislative branch over the executive branch. So, but it's been said, we've heard from other experts that earmarks at times could allow new members to understand the legislative process better, to engage in the legislative process, to familiarize themselves with the process earlier, uh, to get engaged in various legislative initiatives and such. So it's sort of maybe a, a positive connotation towards an earmark. Um, others say that it may empower the minority at times. We've heard about minority-majority uh, differences and help with building bipartisanship as, as well. Mr. Davis and Dr. Evans, do y'all have any uh, any thoughts over the last eight years? Have you seen any of those positive reflections that I've just discussed being eliminated or brushed aside? And is there is there reason for us to consider uh, ad advancing this concept or considering this concept in the future because it might bring more legislative understanding or more bipartisanship or more civility or more productivity? So, Mr. Davis, start with you, and then Dr. Evans. As you know, as a senior member of the Appropriations Committee, there are arguments, as you stated, sir, on both sides of the earmark question. Uh, the one thing that I would point out is that the so-called earmark ban or the moratorium on earmarks is actually not a function of House rules. As you know, um, House rules include a definition of what earmarks are and has notification and, or transparency requirements, if you will. If earmarks exist, they have to be revealed. But there is not a House rule that sort of stops earmarks. And so I would only add that uh, this is sort of a function of leadership policies. You know, we're pursuing the idea that, that uh, for at least for now, that members aren't uh, doing earmarks. And so it wouldn't require a change necessarily in House rules if members believe that somehow a return to earmarks, either partial or complete, was desirable. Mm -hmm. Dr. Davis, on yeah, the process or the procedure or relationships or legislative impacts? What, any reflection over the last eight years you've seen? Uh, sure. Um, th there's this myth out there that presidents don't do pork. Um, they do, and there's actually been a lot of empirical research by, by uh, policy specialists uh, into this, and you're, the main impact of the so-called earmark ban uh, is to shift responsibility for making these, these distributive uh, positions about sort of local projects and the like, over to bureaucrats. And so the question is really, do you know your districts better than they do? And I, I think the answer is yes. Um, um, earmarks or directed spending are part of the core constitutional responsibility and powers of the House of Representatives. Um, and so in that sense, um, I think the earmark ban uh, was probably not a good idea. I understand the logic behind it because people wanted to cut back on pork, but I don't think it had that effect. And it primarily just weakened this body. Yeah, I think there's plenty of evidence that would show that spending has increased over the last eight years quite a bit. Uh, quick question on committee referrals. Uh, this is something that I've had a lot of interest in, and, and, and I've noticed I came out of a General Assembly out of the state of Georgia, and we had a, uh, a process where a bill was assigned to one committee and one committee only. And here, it seems a bill could be assigned to multiple committees, which creates multiple points of conflict or uh, uh, ownership or fiefdoms or whatever you want to say throughout a process. Um, can you share with us a little bit about, is that a breakdown in this process? Can it be fixed? And, and maybe, Ms. Wood, if maybe you can share with us what are states doing about this? Do states do it multiple, across multiple committees, or do they keep it to single committees as well? And I'll start with you if you don't mind. Mr. Chair, thank you, Vice, Mr. Vice Chair, for the question. Yeah, I mean, it depends. That's always the answer with state <laughs> in state legislatures and chambers. You do see some states that do a multiple referral, but the process that you described in Georgia is also common as well. Um, and so that's that's basically my answer to your question on that. One better than the other, you notice in states? Um, that's not really a determination NCSL tends to make judgments on on the process other than to, you know, as I said in my testimony, the states have to determine what's going to work best for them. Yeah. Dr. Evans, any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, multiple referrals are necessary. They've been basically in the rules since the 70s because of jurisdictional overlaps. 
Um, jurisdictional overlaps have, there's a downside to them absolutely in terms of coherence of policy making, but there are benefits as well uh, because you get multiple committees with different kinds of expertise um, you know, uh, taking a look at legislation. And in that sense, uh, it's maybe not a bad thing. As long as there's a primary committee, a uh, primary committee of jurisdiction that takes a lead and there are time limitations on what the others can do so you don't get uh, essentially clogged up. Uh, but, but for me, uh, multiple referrals are probably a, you know, a necessary side effect of, of, of jurisdictional overlaps. One last thought. I know my time has run up, but uh, Dr. Evans, you mentioned a minute ago about the um, uh, the rules and the amendments and the empowerment of the minority and such. And I've noticed that oftentimes it's, it seems that the majority sometimes has a minority within the majority that loses that power as well. So it's not always just necessarily about the minority party. It can be about a minority representation within a majority party as well that, that gets uh, overlooked or brushed aside by the waving of law, the rules, or and such as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, votes have been called, so um, uh, I think it'd be appropriate for us to um, take a quick time out. Uh, we'll all go cast four votes and come right back. Thanks. And we stand at recess.
that the history it's that it's it tends to be more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Evans? Yeah. Uh, doesn't just tend to be difficult. It, it is difficult. I can recall Chairman Hamilton meeting with the Speaker, um, Speaker Foley, and talking about this issue because it was very much on, on his agenda. And Speaker Foley said that um, the, he saw more contention in the Democratic caucus in the jurisdictional reforms of the early 1970s. And any issue was more blood on the floor, as he put it, any issue uh, in his career, and that includes Vietnam. Um, and I think that's 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 not an exaggeration. Um, How do you think we address a lot of the changes we see in the way our economy right. works, all of the, and, and make sure that we are organized correctly to handle these issues? That's that's the challenge. Um, one approach might be to think about bilateral relationships between committees, because often these these committees that have overlapping jurisdictions, there's a lot of issues that are kind of in the in the middle, and you could imagine a situation in which they negotiated out trades where there might actually be a possibility of agreement. So you look at, say, financial services and commerce, um, and everybody's got a, an or in the in homeland security um, uh, water. I just wonder if there were negotiations between the interested parties, whether they couldn't occasionally work something out without actually coming in with a comprehensive jurisdiction reform plan. Mm -hmm. um, that almost never works. Um, the one example where this kind of occurred in, in congressional history was the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1946. Uh, Chris mentioned it. But even there, it was interesting. They changed committee rules and jurisdictions, but mostly they just codified precedents that were already in place. And so they, evolved, they essentially they reformed the, the, the jurisdictions in the direction they were already evolving anyway. So I would, I, would, I would think just go small and look at specific overlaps and see if there's a way to kind of work something out. And uh, Ms. Wood, how do states look at these issues? Uh, and nothing's coming to, thank you for the question. Um, nothing's coming to mind as far as a contentious reform um, process off the top of my head, although I can certainly go back to the office and, and check myself on that. But uh, legislatures, uh, you know, depends on where the rules, what, what the rules say about committees and what types of committees must be in place with respect to standing committees. Um, in other places, leadership has some ability. Um, legislatures, because of the time restraints that I um, mentioned earlier, um, sometimes end up using interim to, you know, to your uh, question about um, you know, new issues and new subjects that um, we have to grapple with as, pol as policymakers have to grapple with. So they use the interim to form committees to study things. Um, so after session is over, uh, often you'll see legislatures, New, Me new Mexico comes to mind, they have a, a very short sessions and they use the interim uh, quite a bit to, to do standing, com uh, to do interim committee work where legislators are going out into the community and um, different places, different corners of the state to learn about the issues that are impacting their constituents. Thank you very much, I yield back Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, next up Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm thinking about what Ms. Wood uh, said about having not seen any contentious committee reorganizations at the state uh, level, either um, uh, thinking about uh, the presentation we saw and the efforts uh, here in Congress. Either the states are just that much better at it uh, than we are, fiefdoms are that much more minor uh, than, uh, than they are here, or, uh, or, or something else. I'd be interested to, to uh, hear after you get a chance to, to uh, reflect, go back to the office and have that, uh, have that conversation if there aren't some bloody floors uh, somewhere that we can learn from. I'd be happy to look for bloody floors, yes. I, I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate that. I, I'm thinking about uh, the, so many of the things that, uh, that bring, uh, bring our hearings together and the, the desire for a productive uh, Congress is uh, is one of those uh, things. We've talked about it uh, uh, here. I don't actually uh, view the rules of the House as having uh, diminished uh, my opportunities as a minority member. I view the body politic as having diminished my opportunities. I'm rewarded for being, uh, uh, for saying something outrageous more than I am for getting something tucked into a bill. We had open appropriations bills in the 1980s that had fewer amendments than our structured appropriations bills uh, do uh, uh, today. And so I I'm, I'm, I'm interested um, in uh, Ms. Wood's word, uh, uh, rules that build trust and, and bipartisanship. Uh, my question is, is about the, the, the makeup of this committee. I, I can't succeed here without uh, Chairman Kilmer also uh, succeeding. I'm made stronger because of my partnership uh, with, uh, with Chairman Kilmer. Uh, that would have been true in reverse in the last Congress when we both served on the nonpartisan uh, bicameral uh, budget process reform uh, committee. Uh, is there, 
I, I recognize the need of the majority to run the House, but if we all want a, a, a more productive committee process and if, uh, if strengthening members uh, is, uh, is one of our goals because we reflect our constituents' views, uh, any experience with nonpartisan committee structures that then lead to a partisan uh, floor exercise? It's not as if we won't get our pound of partisan flesh, but when the, when the sausage is being made, we're going to make that as, uh, as uh, structurally nonpartisan as, as we can. Any, 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 any equally divided committee structures in the states, uh, Ms. Wood, that you can think of? Mr. Chair, thank you for the question, Representative. I, I'll, I'll refer back to my written testimony with respect to your question about bipartisan, bipartisanship, maybe aside from nonpartisanship. Within uh, state legislatures, um, nonpartisanship really comes into play with the staff. You'll see staff, uh, staffing committees, and, and that element is there in many places. Um, but some of the examples that I list about where bipartisanship uh, takes, takes apart in the committee process could include um, uh, rules or practices that have minority members as vice chairs um, or have some other formal role um, or situations where legislatures empower or allow for minorities, uh, the minority party to provide input into the makeup of the committee. Um, that's another example that's done in, in quite a few states um, as well. And then some of the kind of informal processes that I talk about later on in my written testimony um, in Washington, for example, uh, NCSL did research on political polarization and the ability of states to make policy despite the polarization that impacts everybody. And you know, one chair in Washington talked about how he just made it a practice and always make sure somebody got a bill out of committee from his committee, regardless of party. Well, we've heard that from Dan Webster when he was the mm -hmm. first Republican speaker in Florida, the process he put into place uh, to bring all ideas uh, uh, forward. And they ended up overriding a governor's uh, veto of the other party because they created an Article I uh, work product, not a Republican or Democrat uh, work product. Uh, I think it's a fascinating idea to, to have a, a, a substitute instead of a motion to uh, uh, to recommit in the, uh, I know that's the motion to recommit's been something the chairman's uh, been uh, been focused on, but I serve on this nonpartisan committee. I serve on the rules committee, which is nine to four uh, partisan. All I can do in a four member minority is make messaging uh, statements. My opportunity to impact the process has long since, uh, long since passed. Uh, how much of the, the dysfunction that uh, you all would identify, do you relate to the rules of the of the House? I would argue we do have regular order. Regular order is you go to the Rules Committee, they can pass a special rule for anything, and that's exactly what we do. Uh, so the, the order is, is regular every uh, every day because members of the House vote uh, to pass the uh, pass the rule. How much of the dysfunction is, is structural, and how much of the dysfunction really relates to me being responsive to my constituents, and my constituents are asking something different of a Republican member from Atlanta today than they would have been asking of a Republican member from Atlanta 40 years, uh, 40 years ago. Because I wanna, I wanna attack the right problem. I'm not sure the problem is, is the House as much as the political process that sends people to the House. Sure, um, that's a hard question. Um, the, um, I, I think your, your sense probably of your own constituency, uh, constituents and, and, and constituents in, in other districts is they're divided right now. I mean, there's polarization out there in the electorate, but not at the level you see here. Um, the level of polarization in Washington, in Congress, seems to be just more significant. Mm -hmm. Indeed, if you look over time, too, and there's been actually been a statistical analysis of, of, of this, and you look at kind of measures of congressional polarization, mm -hmm. using, using votes and the like, those tend to move first, and then public opinion moves next. And I think it's a striking, and, it, and it's a, a, a strong, robust finding, and it suggests that in part, voters are making up their mind about what they think based on the signals they're getting from office holders as, as uh, uh, transmitted through the media. And so I do think that what happens here has an independent impact on polarization out there. Um, and I wonder how much of this is artificial, um, because if we didn't have, as you know, a rules committee that basically precludes the offering of amendments that would divide the majority party, the roll call record, would look a lot different, It'd be a lot less polarized. Yeah. Well, if you would indulge me, Mr. Chairman, in the, in the Rules Committee yesterday, uh, two days ago, the bill we just voted on, this uh, uh, insider trading uh, bill, it was a bipartisan compromise. It came through at the 11th hour because folks never stopped trying to come together uh, on that uh, issue. Uh, there was one press 
uh, representative in the gallery uh, while we were uh, moving this uh, bipartisan bill, reclaiming Article I authority from the Article III courts uh, that had been uh, uh, de facto legislating in this area. Uh, but we had to put stanchions up down outside the Ways and Means Committee room uh, for the press uh, covering the division uh, here, in, uh, here in Congress. And I, 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 we, we try so hard to fix ourselves. It, it, at some point, uh, our framers have put together a pretty good system uh, for us. It just requires uh, uh, operators uh, that, uh, well, are going to operate the way the chairman and the vice chairman have led this committee. I thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Um, next up, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you. And thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Um, as a new legislator here, um, one of the great frustrations that I've had is the lack of substantive committee time to actually work on bills. And as my friend Mr. Woodall was saying, to have those opportunities to come to bipartisan compromises and such. So I'm really interested in the suggestions that you've been making with respect to how to get more productive committee time. Um, I think Ms. Wood, you talked some about committee schedules, which is something that we've been looking at here. I mean, do you have any kind of best practices you would recommend in that arena? Thank you for the question, Representative. As I mentioned to the staff of the committee, um, we really at NCSO don't tend to couch our um, comments in terms of best practices because we serve all state legislators and all legislative staff and we don't make judgments or determinations. But I'll, I'll just, um, what I can say is that there are some, um, you know, commonalities on scheduling that you see in the states and those are, you know, basically what I listed in my written testimony. I think the the provisions that um, make sure there's a distinction between committee time and floor time, you know, mm -hmm. members feel like that's time well spent. That gives them ample, ample opportunity to be in the two places with respect to the process that they need to be to debate and consider legislation. So I just offer, offer that up. You mean not having to leave a committee meeting to go vote and then come back? <laughs> Something like that. Um, or do two committees at once. You also had something about block scheduling or something for that? Um, yes, that's correct. And, and, not, and in some legislatures, um, especially those, there are you know, nine legislatures, as I think I referenced, that um, you know, don't have to constitutionally adjourn. And so in the legislatures that we call more quote unquote full time, um, you do see more practices that are similar to Congress. And so you can find um, people who have to be in two places at once, depending on their committee assignments, particularly if it's appropriations or budget committee. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, yes, you see more um, focus. People can be in one place, and that's where they need to be. They might have to be somewhere defending their legislation, something they're running somewhere else. Okay. And, and we had a little bit of discussion just now about how you get more minority input in the committee structure. Were there any other recommendations you had that we haven't covered here? I'm just thinking back to, thank you for the question, I'm just thinking back to what I said. Um, again, you know, have, making sure the minority has um, a leadership role or even allowing them as a matter of practice to preside over the committee, that happens. We heard that anecdotally um, in Connecticut. Um, uh, in Nebraska is another uh, crazy off the wall um, idea. They vote for their committee chairs via secret ballot on the floor and they have done that since the 70s. So that would. I assume be a pretty radical departure um, from the way things are done here, but that's another example. Okay. Uh, Dr. Evans, you mentioned um, increasing committee resources, which seems it's certainly something we've talked about here. Um, and I was particularly struck by your suggestion that with better committee resources, then there's less need for people to resort to lobbyists or, or outside influences which might not have the same interests. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And, it, and in terms of the previous question about, you know, encouraging the minority to participate in a meaningful way, too, in committee, if you were to ramp up committee resources, it gives you an opportunity to be creative in the way you do that. Um, I've always been struck with the Armed Services Committee staff. I, I know you serve on judiciary. It mm -hmm. has, I'm, I'm sure, a very different kind of staff makeup there. But Armed Services has long had a cadre of, of, of staff who work for, for both the chair and the ranking minority member. They're hired by the chair and the ranking minority together and they serve the committee as a whole. Um, you can imagine that being used by other panels um, where, and, and the size of this, this bi bipartisan cadre might vary depending on the nature of the jurisdiction, mm -hmm. but where you've got you know, sort of a common base of expertise so that the people are, they accept a common base of facts and, and they disagree about, about interpretation. It's just a, a thought about how that might be implemented. Well, I was struck by that when I was reading that in, in your testimony because 
It, I could draw a parallel when we had our orientation. We had an orientation weekend with the Congressional Research Service. And despite the fact that we have many issues that they outline for us that might be uh, partisan in nature, they approach them from a bipartisan way or basically saying, here's what we have as, in terms of facts. Here are some of the different approaches. They were able to give us the overview in a, a nonpartisan way. And I think it was really helpful both in terms of giving new members the lay of the land and giving us a common um, ground from which we could approach issues, understanding that there were disagreements about the policy choices, but not with respect to basic facts. Um, anything else, Mr. Davis? Do you have anything on this topic? J just to add, Representative Scanlon, and sort of to, to play off the points of some of the discussion, including what Mr. Woodall was mentioning before, one of the key sort of takeaways from what we've seen with rules reform, and one I didn't mention in my oral testimony, but is in my written testimony, is this idea that members uh, successful reforms include members understanding whether the problem being addressed is due to a deficiency in the rules or something else. And so as you look at these questions, that in perhaps is one lens to look at. In other words, is there a problem with the rules or is it simply that the goal is not being accomplished, not that it can't be accomplished under the existing structure? Sounds like the distinction is for Mr. Woodall, whether it's a deficiency in the rules or the deficiency in the members. Okay, I yield back, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the things that we've been focused on, I wanna thank you all for being here for uh, your insight, is uh, how to improve civility here um, in the House, uh, which would dovetail into the polarization issue, I would assume as well. Um, Aside from staffing uh, Dr. Evans' committees with bipartisan staff, which I, I know has been suggested, are there any other ways to encourage more collaboration between majority and minority members on committees? And, uh, I mean, sitting is helpful. Proximity is helpful. Uh, Susan Delbeni and I uh, are lead in, in an outside group on women in high tech, but we don't serve on any committees together. We like to joke that we're part of the Susan Caucus, we lead the Susan Caucus, but we don't see each other that often, get to visit that often. Um, and yet, once you do find how much you have in common and how many ideas you might agree on, are there other ideas you might have uh, for uh, encouraging more collaboration, which I think would result in increased civility? Sure. Um, again, and these are these are all modest, you know, incremental kind of ideas. Nothing particularly earth shattering. But I was I was really struck at the beginning of this Congress with the new consensus ca consensus calendar. Uh, it just struck me that the basic idea behind that was very good. But in many ways, it would operate uh, more more effectively at the committee stage. Um, you could imagine using that basic concept and providing for a mechanism where if a bill is co-sponsored by three quarters, two thirds, you know, pick up a, pick a particular threshold of committee members that it is guaranteed attention by the full committee of some kind of a, of a markup. Now the, the response to that from the chairs will be, but we need full discretion in controlling our own agenda, so on and so forth. So you could imagine having just a day or two set aside within each committee um, once a month, and if there are measures within the committee that have that characteristic, mm -hmm. then you move you move to a markup. That would encourage members to work across party lines in committee, particularly junior members um, who might not have the institutional resources to move things forward. Um, I also think that in the work that you're doing on information technology, the software stuff, this the, you know the online opportunities and the like has some relevance here. Um, back when I served as a staff member, proxy voting was not allowed in committees, and they changed that rule in 1995. And that's had a lot of unintended consequences. I'm not arguing that proxies should be brought back, but they've made it really hard for chairs to schedule markups and to ha just to manage markups. And I think what's occurred, and we saw this in the Joint Committee, which didn't have uh, proxies, was that there was this tendency to push all the votes off to the end, right? Mm -hmm. And so. You, you have the debate, the substantive debate first, and everybody just pounds away, because when you're just talking generalities, there's an intensity to kind of dig in. And then you have votes later on, and often you know, there might be two or three of those votes that actually have a bipartisan split and change the, the legislation. I, it would, I think it would promote civility and deliberation and cross-party accommodation if those votes could occur earlier 
and to do that, you've got to figure out a way mm -hmm. to know who's going to be there then. I mean, is, we've got to know who's going to be in the room at different points. And that seems to me something that maybe there's, a, there's an IT kind of fix for, to make it easier to manage a committee. Okay. Any other ideas? Uh, Mr. Davis, thank you. Yes, let, let me add, ma'am. Although I'm not aware of it actually being introduced as a proposal in Congress, there have been uh, ideas circulated in you know, bipartisan outside groups, for example, some that, for example, Mr. the chair has been involved with, the Problem Solvers Caucus and so forth, have put forth ideas that might fall into that category. For example, uh, an idea that each member, once per session, could have a guaranteed right to have a bill marked up in one committee they serve on, so long as it's co-sponsored by at least one member of the opposite party. Other proposals sort of that have been circulated in that idea are uh, bills that have a certain bipartisan character that are reported by a committee have some privileged status on the floor. In other words, the, the House or the Rules Committee perhaps would have to vote not to take it up. So those are some. Thank ideas. you. Ms. Wood, do you know, are there any state legislatures that focus on this or have any special practices? Uh, some common practice, thank you for the question, some common practices, a consent calendar, you know, that's a, some, a, a feature of many state legislatures, Tennessee, Virginia, Wyoming, Florida, all of those come to mind. In order to put items on that calendar, there does there are sometimes some principles that get applied. Did it pass unanimously out of committee, for example, or is it a quote-unquote uncontroversial or technical piece of legislation? So that's um, those are some criteria that legislatures use to determine um, what goes on the consent calendar. I have lots of thoughts on your question. Um, Utah, for example, allows um, members to prioritize bills, and so it, that it's a practice that lets them uh, focus and supports the members um, in doing that. Um, and as far as, I mean, another other radical things that states do, at least maybe radical in this room, they have joint, some legislatures, three of them, as a matter of fact, have joint House and Senate committee, so you can imagine the collaboration that has to take place in Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, and Maine. Um, other legislatures like Wisconsin and Colorado and Arizona have joint budget or fiscal committees. Um, and in Colorado's case, my, my home state, they it's a bipartisan committee. Um, the House and Senate get equal, uh, three, three members each to a point, and they operate as a team. Um, they have rules of procedure where, uh, you know, the, they usually don't put out the long bill unless there is complete unanimous agreement about it, and then they stick together during the, the bill's process, on the budget process on, in both chambers. So just some. Thank some you, something back. to strive for. <laughs> I yield back. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Newhouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all three of you for being here and helping us with this uh, important topic and a lot of great ideas. Uh, like Ms. Brooks, I'm interested in uh, the civility issue and how we can increase uh, uh, levels of decorum and civility within the, within the, the House of Representatives. Uh, I think that uh, truly uh, the, the, this body reflects the, the American population, um, but I think it's uh, also important that as we reflect back to the, to the people that uh, it makes a difference on how we, we uh, uh, react to each other and treat each other. And so I, I think that, you know, that, that we have a, an important role there. And uh, I hope I'm not you know, overestimating our, uh, how we're held, but I think that certainly it's important for us to be able to treat each other with respect and look, always looking for ways to increase that. And um, Ms. Woods, you talked about that uh, a little bit and how state legislatures uh, maybe encourage that kind of thing. And, and let me just say, uh, uh, it isn't always how we treat each other, it's uh, how we treat other people that maybe are referred to. One of my uh, frustrations, uh, and you know, I, I get that there's a lot of um, uh, energy around uh, the president, but a lot of times he's referred to in, in floor speeches in ways that people get reprimanded for, and but there's never any follow through or any kind of, um, uh, it's just it, your people are told not to do it and then, then someone else does it again. So I'm just curious if there's things that we could do that state rep state legislators maybe do better. Have you thought of, any, or, or this could be what Ms. Scanlon talked about, maybe it's not the shortcoming of the rules, but maybe we all have shortcomings, so I don't know. I can speak to that a little. Make no mistake, I don't mean to be Pollyanna. Legislatures are grappling with incivility, and we have an annual meeting every summer, and it's always a, a, a well-attended session when we do something about um, the importance of civility and respect. Um, it's a, it's a, 
uh, incivility is a phenomenon that state legislatures are grappling with, just as Congress does. But I will say, you know, as, as a shameless plug, NCSL provides a place for people to get together in a bipartisan way and talk about difficult vaccine issues and, and solutions to them. Um, so I don't think you're alone in, in the challenge that you face. Um, I think state legislatures, um, you know, the, the body's smaller, that's another uh, difference. Sure. Um, and sometimes that, that is, uh, allows for people to get to know each other a little better. Um, but there's lots of examples in the states about how to increase bipartisanship, but the yeah. characteristics of legislatures yeah. kind of determine that. Yeah, we've talked about it different ways of, you know, bipartisan retreats and things like that. So um, we'll continue to look at how we can improve that. Um, also, the, I think, Mr. Davis, you talked about the idea of, of of uh, us reclaiming some of our constitutional authority from the executive branch, and um, and that sometimes that has uh, that desire uh, is in, in enveloped in attempts to reform what we do around here. So, um, you know, there's certainly the uh, congressionally directed spending issue, that, but there's other things. Would you have? Um, I guess, uh, any ideas on how this committee can help enact real reform in that, in that area? Uh, thank you, Mr. Newhouse. Well, with, with the caveat, of course, that CRS does not endorse any policies, uh, that's up to the members, uh, I'll just point out the idea that uh, this feeling, this sort of institutional feeling that uh, the legislative branch is at a disadvantage with the executive branch is, as you correctly said, and I mentioned in my testimony, uh, sort of a thread that runs throughout all congressional reform. Essentially, you see this where uh, members feel like uh, they don't have, the, for example, staff concurrent with what uh, the, the, the resources that the executive branch has, uh, that the, basically they have a, uh, can't get information uh, from the executive branch. Some of these uh, procedures that are in house rules that traditionally were used sort of for decades to uh, to get information from the executive branch. Things like resolutions of inquiry, a way to sort of request it, uh, have sort of fallen, uh, they're, they're not effective arguably as they were in prior decades. So I, I simply would, would point out that uh, those that are interested in looking at rules reform might look at these prior sort of uh, tools that committees have, subpoena power, the power for resolutions of inquiry to compel witnesses and so forth, and examine whether this is something that might merit reform. Okay, thank you. And then just real quickly, Dr. Evans, you brought up MTRs, the motion to recommit. Some of us have talked about different possibilities about that, from getting rid of them altogether to trying to figure out a way that they might be more productive and not just you know, prime gotcha moments. Um, you mentioned moving it to the committee of the whole, and I didn't really understand. I guess I'd like you to expound on that idea and how that might help. Sure. Um, Basically, you would guarantee to the minority leader, his or her designee, an opportunity to offer a full substitute as part of the normal uh, the normal uh, floor amendment process, rather than after the fact. Um, so it would be integrated in substantive deliberation more generally. Now, you, you have messaging amendments in the committee of the whole, just like you do on the, the motion to recommit with instructions. But again, the motion to recommit is almost designed to be a messaging yeah, instrument. Right. And I think that it may be the time where um, the majority have to give up some control over the floor uh, legislative process by, by guaranteeing the minority leader a right like that. But the benefits may exceed the cost if it leads people to engage more, more constructively. May I add, Mr. Newhouse, if I may quickly, just to say that those that have argued in, in support of that idea of moving it from the end of the legislative process right before final passage to, as Dr. Evans was saying, in the normal consideration of amendments, point to they argue that an advantage of that is, is it's not a surprise. In other words, you're not seeing the amendment right there with as little as 10 minutes of debate. It would be filed in advance and members would have more sense of what it is as opposed to a sort of a, a last minute oftentimes where the majority is only seeing the minority MTR on the spot. For the first time, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, we may have some follow up on that. Uh, Mr. Timmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Glad to be back. Sorry, I was Welcome gone back. for a few weeks. Um, I also want to say I'm, I'm over here writing notes about things I want to ask, and my colleagues are asking all of them. So uh, I, I think it's great that we are thinking alike, and I, I look forward to trying to make this process more efficient. Um, one thing I want to go back to is committee time and the 
amount of time we spend actually together in the room. Uh, I've been on budget committee, I've been on education and labor, now I'm on financial services, I'm on this committee. This is the only committee where my colleagues are generally here when I speak, uh, speak last, so it, it is what it is. Um, is, are there in any other states, I guess this is a great question for Ms. Wood, um, measurements, expectations of committee attendance and or any mechanisms to whether it is through some procedure or just through tracking uh, committee attendance and the amount of time you actually spend in the room? Thank you for the question, Representative. Committee attendance is taken in, uh, in state legislative committees by a clerk. Um, chairs of committees often have a um, lat latitude of how the um, committee is run, um, and so that might be a determination that they have to make if there's some sort of um, consequence if a member is missing frequently committees. Um, and similarly, there are attendance requirements on the floor that um, legislatures have as well. So it kind of runs the gamut depending on the legislative chamber, but it is a, a, function, a piece of the puzzle in state legislative um, rules and procedure. I would just be very interested to see the percentage of time that a member is in the chair during a committee hearing, uh, you know, on a weekly, monthly basis. I guess on the floor we have voting cards and you have to be present to press the button. So we know whether you're there, but in committees, and you know, I'm not laying blame to any uh, member because we all do it because we have to because of the uh, chaotic schedule. Um, civility is another issue I wanted to touch on. I, I think that the lack of committee attendance is also part of the lack of civility. If you can walk in, drop a bomb and leave, um, it, it's a lot easier than having to have your colleagues analyze the question that you just asked and why they disagree with it. And when you are forced to listen to the room as it considers your policy proposal and whether they agree or disagree with it, you then have to inherently defend or uh, you know, uh, agree with that person's perspective. Um, is there any way, I guess just generally in civil, as it relates to civility, how, how do we hold people accountable when, without requiring attendance, without somehow bringing people, um, holding them accountable for the positions they take when you really can be as loud as you want and, and, and run, run away. Um, any thoughts? Um, I, thank you, Mr. Timmons. I, I would simply say that um, uh, house rules and precedents sort of uh, have things in them that are intended to try to promote civil civility. For example, Mr. Newhouse, I think, was talking about rules of decorum and so forth. Um, but it, it's not clear whether this is a rules problem. In other words, it, it, in other words, to legislate that in committee rules, house rules, I think would be challenging. Um, that's my reaction. So the, the theory of not having any uh, consequence for not showing up, but just merely tracking whether a member was present and to how long they were present. I, I, I've proposed that we could use it for steering purposes. If you are not showing up to your committee, um, you know, more than a certain percentage of time, then maybe you are overextended and maybe we should take that into consideration. So, but in order to do that, we have to actually have data. So something as simple as tracking presence in the room could really be just at least an additional step in the direction. And it's not, I'm not saying that we're gonna then use it for anything in particular, but just to say, you know, percentage of time from gavel to gavel, and uh, you know, this is what each member is. Is that something that y'all think would be a step in the right direction? I, I would just say quickly that um, there certainly is no reason that a, a committee or the House couldn't mandate a rule sort of that attendance be taken. There have been proposals as well, something similar, not exactly on point, but for example, I think even uh, Mr. Kilmer has legislation on this subject that would mandate uh, the creation of some sort of database of committee votes. In other words, committee reports in the House are required to show certain votes, others have to be posted online and so forth, but there's no database similar to the congress.gov database. So that might be one area to sort of think about uh, sure. in that area. I see my time's up. I guess I just want to end. It's not only being present 
when you gavel in. It is the amount of time you spend during the hearing present that I think is what will really help us hold people accountable, really require more civility. So um, I thank you for taking the time to come, and I yield back. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kilmer. And Mr. Timmons, because I usually walk in late, I always get to hear your questions. I will never leave before I hear your questions. Uh, hey, first off, uh, thank you all. Uh, this is a great committee. I'm glad it got extended for another year because I, I hope the bipartisanship that exists on this committee and the suggestions that many of the witnesses like yourselves have offered us actually come, in, come to fruition. Uh, we know we have some institutional problems with the way the House operates, but a lot of the changes, some of the changes that were mentioned in 1995 were changes to fix some of the problems that existed before they were made. Proxy voting was taken advantage of by the committee chairs before it was banned. So we have to, to use history to talk about how we make the processes even better. Um, I, I do wanna ask on uh, Mr. Davis, uh, and, and thank you, because every time they said that, I perked up <laughs> and realized they, they weren't talking to me, they were talking to you. Uh, I, uh, the Rules Committee, uh, the Rules Committee has been used in the past, obviously by the majority uh, on both sides uh, to either to allow amendments, not to allow amendments. Um, I get frustrated when amendments get offered in my committee and they fail and then all of a sudden they appear, they appear uh, as, as an amendment ruled in order. Uh, I thought that's what the committee process was for. Uh, this amendment process, it, it doesn't allow us to say. And frankly, I, I, I see that with the rules committee, it's leadership driven. We usually know what the outcome's gonna be before you go in there on any given amendment. But you've done some research on this. You you see some of the new plans we put in place with the consensus calendar. I got to thank the majority for allowing those new uh, procedures to be in place. Uh, also, uh, and, and I'll get to you too, uh, Dr. Evans, on the uh, the new rule regarding the amendment process of twenty on each side. So I think that's crucial too. But what have you seen in your studies, Mr. Davis, that we can do to change for the better the rules committee process to make it more open? Um, thank you, Mr. Davis. Well, there have been proposals in the past, uh, not adopted by the House, but people have put forth ideas to try to regulate that. For example, similar to what uh, Dr. Evans was talking about, a guarantee, for example, of a particular number or kind of minority amendments made in order. Uh, other proposals have been uh, put forth that would require, for example, a supermajority vote rather than a simple majority to pass a closed rule, making, in essence, making it harder to close the amendment process. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, I guess I would say, is there's no reason the House could not come up with uh, rules that would regulate that process. Ultimately, though, it's not just the Rules Committee, as you know, it's the House agreeing to that special rule. And so those are some thoughts. Okay, all right. Um, I know I don't have a lot of time left. Uh, Dr. Evans, do you want to make any more comments on the, the 2020 amendment process? Is, are there any other ideas that you might have that may be working in state legislatures that can help us uh, help us make a better process here? Because I'm worried we're going backwards. In, in terms of the floor and committee? I mean, would Committee, both. I mean, I, I can tell you personally, that when we were in the majority, a uh, former colleague of mine and a current colleague of mine, we offered some simple three rule changes, and uh, it would have allowed more control for members over the committee process. And uh, it was fun because a lot of the committee chairs who were my colleagues, they were obviously not happy with our proposal. It didn't go anywhere. And then I subsequently find out many of those committee chairs now support uh, rule changes now that they're not committee chairs anymore. And I, I have a fun time pointing that out to them too. Um, we try to make changes. What is the most significant change that we've made that you believe has helped Congress work better in this Congress? Would it be the consensus calendar? Yeah, I mean, I, I would point to that. And again, this is still being explored. I mean, this is a new procedure. Um, and there are other ways to get items to the floor via suspension, so on and so forth. So it's not had this, you know, magical huge impact just yet. But the basic idea of opening up the agenda setting process so that members who work across party lines and, and build a consensus around something know that they have access to a decision. I think that concept is something that could be applied up and down the line. And that's kind of where I would go, versions of that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, you saw the story of the first bill that was about to be on the consensus calendar and somehow it got derailed a little bit. Um, 
that's what we as members are concerned about. And, and that's why I really appreciate each of you being here. Uh, I know, are there any state legislative ideas that we haven't asked you about that you think we could take advantage of? Obviously, don't start in my home state of Illinois. They're not doing too well right now. Uh, but what's working that we haven't asked you about? I'm from Bloomington, Illinois, originally. Oh, so really? I'm a, I'm a so, native. Yep. So was our new senator from Georgia. <laughs> Kelly Loeffler is uh, from Bloomington, Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, which high school did you go to? I went to Central Catholic High School. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. I, I will not ask you what year you graduated, but I'll ask you, you later. <laughs> thank uh, you very much. But no, thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Please give us some suggestions. Uh, well, just with respect to amendments, what I can offer is that many legislatures allow for amendments on the floor. Uh, six chambers prohibit floor amendments. Oregon and Idaho come to mind. Um, about half of those that allow amendments on the floor, uh, there's requirements that they be looked at by a drafting office, be it partisan or central nonpartisan office. Um, 33 chambers uh, encourage or require pre-filing to give both the members and the public, and that's another big element um, that we haven't touched a lot on today, but allowing the transparency and allowing openness for the public to review amendments. Um, and some of those chambers also allow for late filing floor amendments, but there, there usually is a motion that has to accompany that, and there might be a, it could be a simple majority to allow, it could be a two-thirds or three-fifths majority. So just some, some ideas that many legislatures do allow floor amendments, it's part part and parcel of their processes. Great, well thank you very much. I see I'm out of time. Uh, thanks. Um, uh, if the witnesses have a little more time, I, I think a few of us may have a couple more questions if that's all right. I, I wanna get back at this issue, you know, and this, this touches on a number of the things that we, that we discussed, and that is how do, you act, how do you actually engage the minority in a way that is constructive with the hope of moving away from the kind of gotcha dynamic that we have in place now. I came out of a state legislature in, in Washington State. Um, I would describe it as mostly functional. Interestingly enough, everything, uh, every floor uh, vote was under an open rule, which if you had an amendment that was germane in the scope and object of the bill, you could offer the amendment and it was required to get a vote. And I was walking with Mr. Newhouse to the floor and I said, I I'm hard pressed to think of examples where that was abused by and large you know, and there were times where if, some, if the minority wanted to kill a bill, they'd introduce 100 amendments, but by and large, there wasn't a whole lot of gotcha votes. And, you know, that may be because, you know, I, I always describe, you know, engaging people in the legislative process is like walking my dog, right? If I don't walk my dog, you choose the furniture. And to some degree, if people are left on the sidelines, it's far more likely they chew the furniture in the process. And so I guess the question is, how do you achieve real engagement? You know, I, I, if I suggested opening up every bill to an open rule in this place, I think um, people would uh, laugh to the point of tears, right? Um, which is an indication of how uh, things have eroded here. So give us a little bit of guidance of, you know, is there a way to thread this needle in a way that might, sufficiently engage the minority, but thread, thread that needle in a, in a thoughtful way that has them engage in a constructive way. Does that make sense? Sure does, and again, that's a, that's a hard task. It is. Um, and I, I, but I think you, and I like your, your metaphor, I mean, that's spot on, that when the minority or any member, it can be you know, people in the majority who feel left out, but can't engage on serious mm -hmm. substantive legislative issues, it almost invites Causing trouble. Yeah, and so, uh, again, I think the, the real opportunity for engagement is in committee where you have people focusing on areas which have got expertise and particular interest. I also think that generally you've had, you had a lot of strong personal relationships that you might not expect in committee. And I'm sure you can know of all kinds of examples, chairs and ranking members who have great personal relationships where they're politically very different. So my guess is that anything that strengthens the committee stage of the process where more and more decisions are made in, in markup and in hearings, where members of both parties are present. The extent to which you can bring the committees back may be the most appropriate way to, to proceed. Yeah, I, you know, one of the things that we've kicked around is that notion of, you know, so much of this is normative. You know, I don't know how you set rules that say, have a collaborative committee process. I mean, there's things you can do to set the table for 
collaboration, and you know we're making recommendations in that regard. And I think the next round of recommendations, you'll see some thoughts in that regard. Um, but it's it's it, it's tricky, you know. And you could, you know, what what I've struggled with, and maybe you have some guidance on this, is are there a way are there ways to change the incentives or disincentives to encourage that type of collaborative um, committee behavior? And I don't know, Miss Wood, if you've seen anything in the state levels that 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 might uh, incent that. Well, I can take a stab at off, you know, offering an idea. Sometimes legislatures, and more, I don't think most people realize this, but quite often we'll have at least one tied chamber in, in the states after an election year. Um, and it's interesting, in Washington in the House, that happened. And so often um, legislatures will go through that experience just having to kind of create a plan to organize, and they put rules into place to figure out how they're going to move forward. So sometimes lessons can come from unusual um, incidents like that, where the a minority, you know, someone was in the minority, someone was in the majority, now it's more even, and I think that the realization that anything can happen, at, you know, the next year you could have um, a, di a different outcome, and Connecticut's an example of that. Their Senate had a tied chamber, they came up with, you know, some processes, ways to organize and move forward, and then the next year, one of the parties had a majority again. So I think there's some lessons in there, and I can certainly get back to you. Um, representative with information about that. Um, other examples, you know, Maine, uh, I talk about this in my written testimony, uh, they have sort of a practice uh, where the minority majority get together and share information about what the floor, you know, what floor session is going to look like to try to operate as much as possible under a rule of no surprises, knowing that once you get on the chamber floor, anything can happen, but at least there's some baseline expectations that you could set with each other to move forward that day. Any other thoughts there? I would just add that, as the committee knows, as you know, Mr. Chair, the default setting for considering a, mem uh, a bill on the floor pursuant to a rule is an open rule. In other words, that's what the rule book provides for. Right. And so special rules, uh, you know, as Dr. Evans pointed out, over many decades have sort of been uh, moving to more restrictive amendment processes. But traditionally, as you likely know, uh, even with restrictive amendment processes, the regular appropriation bills were always considered under uh, terms that were either an open rule or the equivalent. And so as members are looking at the idea of the Rules Committee and will you return to a more open process, perhaps one option is looking at that tradition that we had until recent Congresses uh, of perhaps just doing the regular appropriation bills or maybe some of them, uh, not all of them. The legislative branch bill, for example, was always a structured rule. but looking at maybe discrete things to see whether there's a way to return to a more open, uh, and, and less structured process on the floor. Mm -hmm. Just one thought for 30 seconds. Um, imagine if uh, Mr. Timmons' suggestion was actually followed through on and you had that data uh, and you knew basically who was physically in the room for committee members, how useful that would be engaging which panels members probably shouldn't be jointly members of right? because you can't be in two places at once. You'd have a sense of maybe how the schedule could be tweaked um, to, to better, uh, to better I don't, I don't know, schedule, you know, you'd block scheduling or something like that. All of that would be easier to do if you had the, the, just the information, the data that you suggested. And also if members knew that that information was being collected, we provide an incentive to show up and stay there. And it might be at that point possible to no longer stack votes for the end of a markup because as you know, that's what drives attendance. If there are votes, people show up. And if those votes are interspersed throughout, you know, title by title, instead of stacked at the end, that provides another incentive. So that information that you're talking about could be really, really useful in a number of ways. Yeah, and I think that gets into a lot of the other things we've talked about in this committee, though, too, in terms of uh, Congress isn't here all that much, right? 66 full, 66 travel days, 65 full days, although I think we're adding four, so um, two more travel days, two more full days. Uh, the average member's on 5.4 committees and subcommittees, and so the capacity to be present in all of your committees is currently hamstrung by the fact that you're usually asked to be in three at the same time, right? That is tricky. So one of the things that we're looking at. Um, Mr. Timmons, you had some follow-ups, and I may have one more before we call it a day. Very brief follow-up. So I was just sitting here wondering how this would be done. It could either be done with a person who would actually have to watch and tally, and that would be terrible, or, um, you know, my phone has face ID, my computer has finger ID, I have a voting card, there's apps for everything. And, you know, I should be able to get up and go to the restroom, get a cup of coffee, but, you know, if I'm gone for more than 10 minutes, it starts the 
absent. And, and again, I'm not saying that we have to be here. We will inherit. There's no way we're going to fix this where you're here 100% of the time. It's not possible. And, you know, even if we uh, succeed with this block scheduling concept, you're never going to be able to uh, not have an emergency intel uh, briefing or, you know, there's life happens. And just knowing who is wh who is not a part of the process, who is not listening. And, you know, that would also then, if everybody's sitting here for hours and hours, the next question is 54 people on the Financial Services Committee, does everybody need five minutes? Or maybe we get together and we pick five people, they get 10 minutes, and there's some sort of a system for that. But um, I just think that it, it would force, if we make everybody work together, I mean, it would literally be forcing people to work together because if you're showing up to 9% of the time that the committee that you're on is meeting, um, that's not a good thing. And I think that that would create challenges for you in other ways. Um, May I yes, just please. mention, Mr. Jones, thank you, sir. Just to add that, um, I mentioned this in my written testimony, but there are innovations uh, already going on in the House, uh, and I'm sure you're thinking of them and your colleagues on House administration, but for example, it seems to me that uh, your discussion of, of being in committee is directly related to member time, right? And there are things going on, for example, one at least one committee in this uh, 116th Congress has had an electronic voting system in committee, which has made it much easier, much quicker to do recorded votes Literally, they can do them in seconds as opposed to maybe, you know, five, ten minutes. You're probably very familiar with the uh, the Armed Services Committee has been doing NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act markup, with pre-filed amendments on tablets. And so some of these innovations that would save time in committee may go to some of the concerns you're raising. Members may feel less conflicted if the markup or the hearing is being conducted more quickly. Can, do you mind if I hop in on this? Absolutely. So... All of the things you just mentioned are allowed under current rules. I believe that's correct, sir. Right? The committees, if they want, could do electronic voting. They could follow the pre-filing on tablets. I, I, th I think, Mr. Chairman, that uh, subject to regulations issued by the House Administration Committee, I don't know of a House rule that would preclude it. Is there, can you think of a way that we could encourage that? Um, I can certainly give it some thought, sir, and report back to the, the committee, me and my colleagues at CRS. Um, just to add, and not to be overly cautious, but to say there, there are also questions about it. In other words, there are, for example, if you're doing markups on tablets, that sort of presupposes that all the amendments have to be pre-filed. Now, members may not want to do that. So there are some things to work out, but I simply point out that these things are sort of going on or starting. And as I mentioned in my testimony, some of the successful reforms that have happened in these prior efforts that we've been talking about, sure, there's been new ideas, but a lot of it has been identifying things that are promising, that are already going on, and codifying and promoting them. So we're happy to get back to you and your staff, sir, uh, with some ideas. I didn't mean to, I, I just no, wanted I'll to just, pull on that thread, but please I'll go ahead. Follow up, just an app on this phone, I mean, it has face ID, it is more secure than any system we could ever have, and it is so efficient. And if all of our votes were done here, you could only make my vote, me allowed to vote if I was in whatever room I needed to be in. So if you're not on the floor physically, you cannot vote on the floor. If you're not in committee physically, you can't vote. And talk about tracking, I mean, this is getting some Big Brother stuff, but I mean, it could literally track whether you're in the committee room or not. That would be the easiest way to do it. I have a feeling there's a lot of reasons people would push back on that. <laughs> but at the same time, I, I just think that I mean, this is the future of our country. We have trillions and trillions of dollars in debt. We haven't fixed an immigration crisis that is long overdue. And I think the problem is process, and a lot of it's time-related. A lot of it is schedule. And um, if we can succeed in this committee and find a way to make the process better, it will facilitate the ability to solve the problems. With that, thank you. Thank you. Um, let me just ask uh, one one final thing. The, there was some mention of um, uh, committee structures, committee staffing, and the use of, of nonpartisan staff. That, that certainly existed when I was in the state legislature. That exists on the Armed Services Committee here. Actually, this committee has bipartisan staff. To um, the credit of Mr. Graves, at the beginning of this, we said, what if we just, rather than 
diluting our resources to hire people who put on blue jer jerseys and red jerseys. We would just hire people to put on Go Fix Congress jerseys. And um, I guess my question is whether you think we could actually make this work in other committees and what the mechanism for making that happen might be. I think you could in some committees. I'm, I'm familiar with the old Foreign Affairs Committee and they had partisan staffs, but they were partisan staffs that worked together a lot. And I think there are most committees, you could have some small cadre and then be larger in some than, than in others. And the way to do it, I, I assume, would be through the annual committee funding resolution. Uh, and Chris, what, what's your sense? So, Mr. Chairman, this is not an area of, of, that I have expertise in, uh, committee staffing regulations, but I'm happy to take this back to my colleagues at CRS and come back with some ideas. Um, I'll say that th I believe there is uh, this opportunity to hire non-designated staff under the rules. As you say, we see that in, in certain committees. Um, one thing, just as a note of caution to throw out, is that people oftentimes look, for example, to, you know, each committee has a different culture, for, for lack of a better word, right? And, and it's because the House lays down certain broad parameters that it expects committees to follow, but then allows them to come up with their own sort of rules of procedure and their own, they have their own culture. Uh, and so, um, some of this, you know, this tradition that the Armed Services Committee had may or may not be able to be replicated in other committees that have a different culture, but we're certainly happy to look at the rules and come back and consult with your staff about kind of how something like that might be achieved under the rules. Well, so in, in that regard, you know, the, so much of this gets boiled down to culture and norms, right? And, and I, I find myself wondering if there are levers that might in, encourage culture change. Right, um, you mentioned the sort of committee, um, the resolution that funds the, the various committees. I find myself wondering, you know, if at the beginning of a Congress you could get a chair and a ranking member to agree on, uh, on, on sort of the rules of the road, right? How are we gonna share our resources? How are we gonna consider what witnesses to call, what bills to, to hear? Not necessarily that we're gonna agree on everything, but at least agree to what the rules of the road are gonna be. Is there a way that you might incent that kind of agreement on the front end, either in the amount of funds that a committee gets or through expedited floor consideration or something? And candidly, I don't know the answer to that. I'm just you know thinking out loud. That seems like a worthy thing for us to be thinking about because to, to your point, there, you know, there is in this place um, some areas where the culture says, dear God, don't do that. And I'm wondering if there's a way to get past that. So I would um, certainly invite your continued rumination on that. Um, I don't think there's any other questions and people are dropping like flies. So um, with that, <laughs> with that um, I'd like to thank our witnesses for their testimony today. I'd like to um, uh, thank the person for transcribing. Uh, the work we're doing, and I'd like to thank our staff for the good work they've put to, uh, in putting together another uh, very um, insightful hearing. So thank you for that. Without objection, all five members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. Thanks, everybody.